that there is no highest order of infinity. It only gets infinitely higher. So that means, you know, like there's different natures of infinity and some correlate and you can actually use them. That's why we have all these neat graphics and neat technologies because we use algorithms of infinity to do this kind of things. You know what I mean? So it just keeps on going. You know what I mean? And then and then you get the nature of zero. You can create anything from zero. You know, zero is, is like a, a, a letter to word. A zero is to numbers as a letter is to a word. You, you take a zero and you construct one. So one is just another kind of way of symbolizing zero in a sense. <laughs> and so you can build all this stuff up. You know, another thing that mathematics says. One last thing it says that no matter what axioms or rules or beliefs or uh, uh, proofs that you have to describe something, the truth there will always be a truth that is inherently not provable or disprovable by said logics. And so what you'll have to do is completely reform the basis of your logics to incorporate the new truth. But then when you do that, there's this other truth that's neither provable nor not provable, and it takes the adjustment of the whole thing to incorporate it. So it says that there is no set in stone. There is no set rules or, or basic pattern of anything because, unless you think of this as the basic pattern, because there's always this higher truth that has to be incorporated. And in the incorporation of that truth, there is new constructs that have to be made at the very base level. You know, so things have to completely shake up, change around, and now you have a whole new basis. And that new basis you're acclimated to and you start to learn stuff with, and then all of a sudden you see this truth out there that you can start to get a glimpse of, but it can't fully prove it or not prove it until you break the foundations of everything that you have, the logic, the rules, the laws, the beliefs, the thought patterns, the truths, the identity constructs, the attachments. Break them all up. You know, and then they rearrange in a way that incorporates a higher truth. And this is a continual process, and that's basic mathematical things. This is more than one plus one is two. This is more mathematical than one plus one is two. You know, so that's the kind of stuff that I pay attention to because I really love math. Now, some people say... ...of what's true in mathematics is not governed by rules. And whatever rules you lay down, you can always transcend those rules. If you accept the rules, you can see how to go beyond them. And this is amazing. I didn't, it's, hard, it's really hard to see this. You could say, okay, maybe all we do is believe these axioms and these rules, and that's all we do. And then Gödel says, no, no, you have to believe this too. If you believe those rules, you must believe this other thing, which is beyond the rules. So what's going on, you see? If it was, and this rules tearing in his idea of a computing machine showed idealize what, what rules mean and what it is to follow a computation. And this, this is a way, somehow it shows that the mind, in our understanding, whatever understanding means, is not something you can encapsulate in a computation. So this idea had been with me for many years. But in the world of math, unfortunately, there are great composers. Every day lots of math is created, but no one plays math. So the world, the beauty of mathematics, is only accessible to professional mathematicians. And I wanted to change things a little bit. Actually, three years ago, I started doing math concerts at places like these halls and restaurants and even at temples. I talk about mathematics, and non-mathematicians come to listen to mathematics. And I wish that not only me, but more people start doing math concerts so that the beautiful world of mathematics will be accessible to non-mathematicians. Well, anyway, let's get back to the subject. I said that math is not just about numbers. Then what is it about? Mathematics is called sugaku in Japanese. Su means numbers, and gaku means the study of something. So sugaku means the study of numbers. And I don't think this is a good, well, translation because this gives the impression that mathematics is actually about numbers. But the word mathematics originally comes from this Greek expression, ta matemata. Ta matemata means things we gain by taking, but it's not the taking in the ordinary sense. It's the taking of what we already have. So we usually take something that we don't have, but ta matemata means things we gain by taking, but the taking is the taking of what we already have. Well, this is difficult. In other words, mathematics in its original sense means the taking of what you already have 
and the knowing of what you already know. So what does that mean? There's a Japanese mathematician called Oka Kiyoshi, and I hope everyone would, will remember this name after this presentation. He used to be in Kyoto, and he's one of the world's most, well, most known Japanese mathematician. And Oka was actually so great that some people in Europe thought that Oka was the name of a group. They couldn't believe that he did all this job by himself. Just one single person did all this job. They couldn't believe it. And Oka was not just a great mathematician, but he was also a profound thinker and philosopher. He has left some great quotes and beautiful essays on the nature of mathematics. And in particular, he repeatedly said that mathematics can say nothing of the first number one. Well, obviously, numbers are the most simplest objects in mathematics. But if you try to explain why the first number one has to exist, or what the first number one is in the first place, no matter how hard you try, mathematically or logically, you will never be able to explain or never be able to prove the existence of the number one or what the first number one is. We simply believe it. It's the believing of something with no grounds. Without this power of our mind of believing things, Math will be totally groundless and meaningless. So at first sight, math seems to be about numbers and calculation and logic and all that stuff. But underlying calculation and logic, there's this huge dimension in our minds that underlies all calculation and logic. So at the heart of mathematics, there's not numbers, there's not logic, there's not calculation, but there's this huge dimension our inner universe, which Oka Kiyoshi called Jojo. And Jojo is a difficult Japanese word. I was looking for a good translation for it, a good English word that corresponds to Jojo, but unfortunately I wasn't able to find one. So let's just call this Jojo. <laughs> Jojo. So in Oka's terms, Math is not about numbers, math is not about calculation, math is not about logic, math is about jojo. It's the very act of looking inside your mind and, well, encountering with your own self, encountering with your own rich inner universe, your jojo. So if you want to do mathematics, pick up a problem. It doesn't have to be a difficult one. You don't even have to prove a theorem that no one has proved yet. Just pick up a problem, it can be an easy one, and concentrate on it. Try to solve it yourself. Don't look at the answers, don't cheat. Keep on thinking about a problem until you figure your way out by yourself. Then, so you have to be patient, you have to keep on paying attention. Being patient and keeping attention on one subject is very important. And during this mindfulness, you'll find yourself encountering with your own mind. And you're, if you're lucky enough, you'll find yourself swimming around in the sea of Jojo inside your mind. Well, try it if you have time. <laughs> so this was a very short presentation on mathematics. And basically, I only have one message. Math is not about numbers. Math is not just about calculation. Math is not just about logic. Math is the very act of looking inside your mind and encountering with your inner selves, with your inner universe, with your inner rich whole dimension of Jojo. So in this sense, everybody, including you, can be a mathematician. Thank you very much. Thank you. This in the margins as he was studying a mathematical problem in set theory. Quote, each definition is a piece of secret ripped from nature by the human spirit. I insist on this. Any complicated thing being illumined by definitions, being laid out in them, being broken up in pieces, will be separated into pieces completely transparent even to a child, excluding foggy and dark parts that our intuition whispers to us. By by separating the object into logical pieces, then only can we move further towards new successes 
due to definitions, unquote. By linking naming to mathematical definition, and by describing definition as, quote, a piece of secret ripped from nature, unquote, Luzon revealed his differences, both with traditional mystical views of naming that I've already discussed a bit, and also with Western rationalism, especially the French form so followed by his mathematical colleagues in Paris. According to the ancient Greeks and many later mystics, naming was a way to gain a pow power over a thing that you name. But Luzon believed that naming was a two-way street involving both losses and gains. When one named something, Luzon thought one gained in effectiveness what he called, quote, new successes due to definition, unquote, but one at the same time also lost what he called, quote, the foggy and dark parts our intuition whispers to us. Thus to Luzon, naming and definition are the awkward, incomplete, and inadequate tools that we must by necessity use in order to do mathematics, <laughs> but which fall far short, short of encapsulating the entirety of the objects they allegedly describe. Luzon saw this at be as being at the heart of the field of mathematics he created, which is called descriptive set theory. According to French rationalists like Borel, Lebec, and Baer, one should follow Descartes and, quote, commence with objects the simplest and easiest to know and ascend step by step to the knowledge of the more complex, unquote. But Luzon differed fundamentally with this form of logical reductionism. To him, the entirety of an object is far greater than, it, than its individual characteristics that might be named or described. Define engineering. Engineering is the application of knowledge in order to design, build, operate, and maintain things. What kind of knowledge? Scientific, it can be economic, it can be political, it can be analytical. And what are the things that I'm talking about? Structures, machines, devices, systems, materials, and even processes. So you guys are, there's probably more engineers in here than we thought at the beginning of the talk, and I'm gonna make you raise your hand again. Wait. But the, the Nobel, the prizes aren't why we do this research. We do this research to figure out what our universe is at the very fundamental level. So what is it we found out using this enormous machine? I want you to imagine the fabric of space-time without space or time, just as an empty, four-dimensional fabric with absolutely nothing in it at all. Now imagine the flow of time appearing in this fabric. When you do this, you have to choose some arbitrary direction to be the flow of time. It works a lot like this. If I take this arrow and I balance it on the stage on its tail as perfectly as possible, and let it fall, it's unstable, and it falls in some arbitrary direction. This is the process of symmetry breaking. This arrow chooses one specific direction, and now this sets a direction over the entire stage. Now I can say, walk two arrow links from here and turn, and, and here I am. It sets a direction and a sense of scale. And this is exactly the way symmetry breaking works in our universe, to produce the direction for the flow of time. And now, in our universe, after symmetry breaking, I can say, proceed 14 billion years from the Big Bang, then turn perpendicularly from time into space, and travel to a pale blue insignificant planet in the Milky Way galaxy, and here we all are. Computers. Here's a closed universe where the lumps are bigger. They should be this big across. If they're 100,000 light years across, they should look that big. Well, that's bigger than these lumps. Here's an open universe, and you can't see the resolution of the screen isn't that good, but the average size lump is about that big, smaller than these lumps. But just like Goldilocks, <laughs> in a flat universe, it's just right. In fact, it's right now, we know, to an accuracy of better than 1%. The universe is flat. It has zero total energy, and it could have begun from nothing. And I've written a piece, although, of course, I got a lot of hate mail, 
saying that in my mind this answers this crazy question that religious people always keep throwing out, which is, why is there something rather than nothing? The answer is there had to be. If you have nothing in quantum mechanics, you'll always get something. It's that simple. It doesn't convince any of those people, but it's true. Now, great, we know the universe is flat, but if you've been awake, you realize, I, 10 minutes ago, I proved the universe was open. There's only 30% of the stuff in the universe needed to make it flat. Where's that other 70%? Well, if you put energy in empty space, so empty space weighed something, you wouldn't see it. It's the empty space between the galaxies. You're far away from the galaxies, you wouldn't see it. But what would that empty space do if you put energy in it? Well, it produced a cosmological constant. That would cause the expansion of the universe not to slow down over time, as any sensible universe should do, but to speed up over time. In 1998, people measuring these supernovae at large distances to measure the Hubble diagram tried to see what was happening at large distances to see if, that, if, the, if the universe was slowing. Well, they all knew the universe was slowing down. They wanted to measure how much. This doesn't look like much, but it was a revolution in cosmology. I can, I can draw a straight line through that data set there and bring the whole thing down and make it horizontal. And if the universe was slowing down, these distant supernovae should have followed this curve. Much to the surprise of the observers, the supernovae lay above the straight line. And, um, and the only way to explain this, well, there's two ways. Either the data's wrong, which it usually is, or the universe is accelerating, speeding up. And if just for fun one believed it was speeding up and asked how much energy would you have to put in empty space to make it speed up by the amount we measure it, it's exactly the amount we are missing. Everything holds together. Our new picture of cosmology is that we live in a universe dominated by nothing. The largest energy in the universe, 70% of the energy in the universe, resides in empty space. And we don't have the slightest idea why it's there. Now, that's what I just said. Let me also put an aside before I get on to the rest in the last five minutes of the talk. This completes, in some sense, the ultimate Copernican principle. Copernicus told us we didn't live in any place special. We now know two things. Well, one thing. I'll tell you the second one in a second. This tells us that we are more insignificant than we ever imagined. If you take the universe, everything we see, stars and galaxies and clusters, everything we see, if you get rid of it, the universe is essentially the same. We constitute a 1% bit of pollution in a universe that's 30% dark matter and 70% dark energy. We are completely irrelevant. Why such a universe in which we're so irrelevant would be made for us is beyond me. Okay, good. And I wanted a little bit of applause. Now we can go back to the science. Um. It doesn't explain why it was this very special state. So the proposal that I put forward, what I call conformal cyclic cosmology, or CCC, is that what was before was, well, now here's the second trick. You see, there are two tricks. These are mathematical tricks, but I'm, tr I'm trying to say they're really part of physics. The mathematical trick number one I just described, that is to say the Big Bang, to describe what it was like, you can stretch it out and it becomes a smooth boundary. Now the other trick is you go all the way out to infinity, now that I'm talking about the future infinity, way, way in the distant future, when every, all, our, all life is exhausted and black holes, they finally evaporate away and disappear in about Google years, that's 10 to the 100 years you need for the biggest black holes to go, maybe longer. Depends how big they get. And after that, that's what I call the very boring universe. There's absolutely nothing of any interest going on. Now, you see, that was the sort of thing that set me off thinking, you know, it's a bit of a shame to have this. That's what we're in for, you see, this very boring, uni boring universe. But then I thought, well, there's this other trick we've played around with for a long time, and that is to squash down infinity. Now, most of the stuff that will be around in this very late stage will be photons. And photons don't have any mass. They don't care. Big from small is completely equivalent. So that it, uh, they, they don't know that the universe is that big. Right. So as far as the photons are concerned, again, you can apply this kind of trick. And future 
infinity is another nice smooth boundary. This actually comes about because of one of the recent fundamental observations in cosmology, which is that the accelerating expansion had been observed, which people refer to as being caused by some mysterious dark energy. I prefer to say it's simply Einstein's lambda term. In 1917, I think it was, Einstein suggested a modification to his original equations, which he suggested for not actually a good reason, but never mind. It was a very good suggestion, because it's the only thing you can do to his equations without ruining them. And he knew that. So he said, well, maybe there is this other term, this thing called lambda, the cosmological constant, which maybe is there. Now, if you have that term, his equations... And if this lambda thing is positive, then the future has this nice smooth character, which I knew from long ago. Mm -hmm. And that seems to fit against this Big Bang. So here's the crazy idea. And I used to say, you know, this is a crazy idea, more or less um, trying to prevent other people from saying it first. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea was that it's not so crazy. Because the squashed down infinity is very like the stretched out Big Bang. Extremely like it. And the idea is, okay, maybe that, but not our infinity, it has to be somebody else's. So there was what I call an eon. Our eon is the Big Bang to infinity. And th there was another eon before us, according to this scheme. And its infinity squashed down is just our Big Bang stretched out, and they just fit. And this keeps on going one after the other. There is a current view that consciousness is something which arises from some complicated computation. So we have our computers, and people think that because they can do things amazingly fast, and they can calculate very quickly, and they can play chess extremely well, that they're superior to us even and that it's only that some complicated aspect of this computational activity, somehow consciousness arises from that. Now, my view is quite different from this. I think there is a lot of computational activity going on in the brain, but this is basically unconscious. So consciousness seems to me to be something quite different. What we do when we understand something is not computing. There's something else going on. But at the same time, I'm a great believer in science and that what's going on in our heads is still obeying the same laws that are going on in the universe outside us. However, those laws are not things that we necessarily fully understand today. To be understanding something, you need to be aware of it. And to be aware of it, you're conscious of it. And so you're invoking your consciousness. So to me, there is something outside the computational laws of physics. And when I, was, I wrote my book, The Emperor's New Mind, I was trying to develop this idea, and I was trying to say, well, there is something else out there. What could it be? Where is the, most, the biggest gap in our understanding of physics? There are lots of gaps, and you know, we don't know what governs the masses of particles. We don't know all sorts of detailed things. But most of these things don't have a direct bearing on what a brain does. I mean, it's the wrong scale. There is a big gap in our understanding of the laws. And this big gap is within present-day quantum mechanics. There are two procedures in quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation and the making of the measurement, and they're inconsistent. I say it quite strongly. It's not just that we haven't got the right interpretation of quantum mechanics. They're just inconsistent. Now that's interesting. If there was a huge gap, maybe that gap is where the theory has to be outside a computational system. Okay, this is... Uh, many people will dispute that and they say, well, this is, you know, taking your logic too far and so on. Well, it seems to me there is logic in this. The next step, though, is the one that people mostly question. Because if inside our heads we are exploiting that gap. That needs, it means that we have quantum development in the system which takes us to a level somewhat beyond present technology in our experiments. Experiments still support quantum mechanics and we have not yet seen 
where something new has to come in. But there are good reasons, in my opinion, when we look at going back to these two major revolutions of 20th century physics, quantum mechanics on the one hand, Einstein's theory of general relativity, space-time is not flat, it's curved, gravity is not a force, it's somehow a curvature. There is some, something quite different from other kinds of physics going on there. If you bring these two great theories together, we see this conflict suggests strongly that there must be a change in the rules of quantum mechanics at a certain level. And that certain level is not too unreasonable that it should be relevant in the brain. Because it has to do with the movement of mass of a very tiny amount. It's very big for quantum mechanical experiments, but very tiny for even for things in biology. So we're looking for tiny displacements of mass. That's the Schrodinger's cat, if you like. They can be in two places at the same time but then it spontaneously becomes one or the other. And in its becoming one or the other, it's doing something non-computational. Now, when I wrote The Emperor's New Mind... Yeah. The locus of ancient lore. The universe is a hologram. A hologram, you know, is a three-dimensional image that's projected from two dimensions. And you record it in a, in a, in a typically in a photographic plate. That's the old-fashioned way of doing it. And all the information for the image in 3D is stored in this plate. Um, and then when you re-illuminate it, you get a three-dimensional image. But if you take the plate and smash it into a million pieces, take one little piece of the plate and re-illuminate it, images. you don't get one little piece of the image, you get the entire image. All the information is, is in every little location. It's just a little more blurry or, or less focused. So it turns out that consciousness and memory in the brain are arranged as a hologram. and even more astounding, the universe is a hologram. Uh, we were talking about that, that discovery recently with gravity waves, looking at gravity waves uh, emanating from the Planck scale, and they found noise in these, de in these detectors, which they, uh, first they thought were some kind of artifact, but they found that the noise, uh, the same information pattern repeated roughly every three orders of magnitude going up from the Planck scale up to the level of uh, biology. So <clears throat> the universe is a hologram and this uh, repeating noise, the scale-free dynamics scaling up, gets to the level of the brain uh, or to the level of biology. Now on the other side of the coin... So let me stop you there because this is mind-boggling. You and I are having a conversation. We're in this plane, place in New York City which is part of uh, the planet and all this is being orchestrated from a two-dimensional surface somewhere on the edge of the new universe uh, in, a, uh, in a black hole? Well, not necessarily. I think uh, the idea emanating from a singularity or black hole would be that it came from the Big Bang, perhaps. So okay. I don't know about some other black holes. There, okay, there are a lot from, of them. from the Big yeah. Bang. But um, the, other, uh, the other side of the coin is that uh, neuroscientists, for example, Mar Marcus Rakel, has, has shown that if you look at the brain waves at different frequencies in the brain, you can go from fairly slow, like roughly 10 seconds, which is roughly the order of, of a, a given th train of thought, down to, uh, to uh, hundreds of uh, cycles per second, down even uh, to nanoseconds, so it's roughly every three orders of magnitude. But, uh, so there's a gap between that and what we know coming up from the universe, and that's where the microtubules step in, because they have resonant frequencies um, in the kilohertz, and in, the, in the megahertz, the actual microtubules vibrate in the megahertz, and also in the gigahertz, the water inside the microtubule core. So if you go from the brain to the neuron to the microtubules, you connect it to the universe, and we're one big, uh, uh, we're several steps on this hierarchical level from the Planck scale on up. So when you meditate, uh, and if you reach an altered state, you might go from having, say, 40 or 80 cycles per, uh, thoughts per second, skipping uh, to, say, 8,000, or to 800,000, or millions and, and every uh, three orders of magnitude. And as you go down in scale, you increase frequency, you increase the intensity, you increase the vastness and the vividness of the information. So that could be your, your locas in, in uh, Vedanta, uh, your astral planes even, that can exist at these, at these smaller levels scale-wise, but vaster levels in terms of information processing. Well, you know, the word Actually, in my latest paper, which is unpublished, it's in peer review right now, it passed the first level of peer review, I'm really excited about it. I actually flushed that out, and it comes out naturally from the equation. I'm not 
you know, attempting to make that proof. It's just a proof that comes out directly out of the equations that I've been writing. And um, it's, a, it's equations that are attempting to unify physics. And as a result, it unifies everything. And it's, it's remarkable. And if I was to describe it in simple terms and in an easy way to describe, um, basically, uh, it was found almost a hundred years ago that space, the vacuum, the space between things, the space between planets and stars and galaxies, or the space between atoms in a in a molecule, or the space inside the atom, which is 99.99999% space, uh, is not empty. It's full. Um, that we're bathing in a fundamental energy that's at the source of all of creation and actually this was known by many ancient civilization all around the world in earlier time and then was kind of lost through uh, the advancements of physics and I think we're coming back to it now um, realizing the in quantum theory it's called vacuum fluctuations and and when they were discovered when we tried to analyze how much of these fluctuations, how much energy there was in the space inside the atom uh, we found that it was infinitely dense with energy, that the vacuum, that space inside the atom is not empty at all, but full of energy. And it might be hard to conceptualize, but maybe an example I could give is like, right around us right now, there's all sorts of, you know, microwaves and radio waves and all this stuff. And we think there's nothing, you know, until we take a radio station, for instance, and tune it in, and then we hear a voice, and we realize, yes, they, there's, you know, radio waves going around, and so on. It's a little bit like that. We look at the vacuum, we look at space, and we think it's empty. Mm -hmm. But in it, embedded in it, is this incredible energy that my theories are starting to show is actually the source of everything, the source of all the material world, which is mostly space. When we're talking about this stuff, you know, all of our material, we're made out of 99.99999% space, and that space is full of all this information. And it is the medium that connects all things. Uh, so for instance, when I, I analyze the amount of energy inside the volume of a proton, which is the nuclei of an atom. It's really, really, really teeny. It's the teeniest little thing. When I, s I analyze how much of this vacuum energy there is there, I find the exact mass of the universe. That is, all the other protons in the universe, all the other atoms in the universe are holographically expressed within one proton, showing that it's all interconnected. So magnificent. So, so we are all at every single moment in our life. We are connected to all that is. There is a way for us to connect to this infinite source of energy. We've been separated from it for a long time. That's right. And when you actually um, uh, look at all the great masters that walked the earth and try to teach us new ways of being and, and expand our mind and expand our consciousness, they all talked about turning inwards and going towards the singularity, towards the center where, you know, this energy where we could connect with the universe, where we could connect, you know, they might have said with God or, you know, but it has always been there in so many ancient tradition and you know now I think we're, it's time to write the physics for it and understand how it actually works and then when I did not only did I get the mass of the universe but I can I, from the relationship of these vacuum fluctuation on the surface of the proton to the inside vacuum fluctuation I was able to extract an exact solution to gravity I was exact I was ab able to exact extract the exact mass of the standard mass of the proton I was able to extract how many particles there is in our universe how big is our universe what is its energy level how many of our universes there is in a larger one how many of those ones there is in a larger one because now we've got the yardstick now we've got the measuring scale so that we can understand the whole thing because 
you know, this realization that we're actually bathing in a field that connects all things. And it's, it's holographic and fractal in nature. So from analy analyzing a piece appropriately, we can understand the whole. Anything else? For example, you had thought, like I had used to think, the sky was blue, whether humans were around or not. The sky's blue. It's just how it is. Okay? Um, but that's not how it is. It's all in our head. Okay? What we know of the universe, right? we know the universe, we know that, what I love is the, we have our own creation story, the Big Bang, the beginning of space and time, and we know a lot, and we, we, we know that out of 100% of the composition, the stuff, the stuff that makes up the universe, we're only dealing, our own, our total reality is only dealing with 4% of it. 96% of it we label as dark matter or dark energy because it either doesn't emit light or if it emits light, it doesn't have anything to do with us, right? right? I'm not talking about invisible light like gamma rays and microwaves. They got stuff to do with us, right? like microwave. Okay. So what are we stuck with? We're stuck with ma the matter and energy that we know and our total reality, our total, what you see out there is dependent on what? Visible light, electromagnetic radiation. Yeah, light again, not, yeah, okay. And of that, we just see visible light, okay? And what do we do? Okay, this, okay, do ocean waves have color? Do radio waves have color? Do sound waves have color? Light waves don't have color. They're waves, okay, okay, right? right? And what happens is, the longest wavelength, like any kind of wave, you measure, hey, what's the next break? You're on, you know, crest to crest. Longest wavelength, we paint in violet. Shortest wavelength, we paint in violet. And then every other color in between with every other wavelength, we do it really, really fast. And when I say paint it in, I mean just like those color by number books. You know, three's yellow, four is blue, and then you got a picture. It said we're coloring in by wavelength. And it's, you know, you dream at night and you go, holy fuck, a duck, how do I do that? That's amazing, creating a 3D landscape with your eyes closed. Hey, we're doing exactly the same thing right now with our eyes open. We're creating an image in our head based on the light we're receiving, except now it's even crazier. We're seeing it out there. The image is actually in our head. All right? It's not that there's not an isness out there or something's out there, but it's a far cry from what we're looking at, folks. Okay? 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 okay. Now, where I find it's interesting is I bring time into the equation, and E equals MC squared tells us a very fascinating thing about time. That even time is not absolute. Time is not this ineluctable linear thing that's clocking off. For example, the way time works is the faster an object of mass moves against the speed of light, the slower it physically experiences time. Two twins born today, put one in a rocket ship and send them off at 200,000 kilometers a second, two thirds of the speed of light, bring them back in 40 Earth years, Earth twins 40, rocket bound twin steps out, he's still a hunk of 20. Aged half the time because he was going so fast against the speed of light. That's standard physics. Where I've taken it is, I ask, what's light's relationship to time? Okay? Light, the photons, are going at the speed of light. Therefore, in English, the best I can do is they're not in time, they're outside time, they're not experiencing time. Right? They're going at the speed of light. They're massless, but they're going at the speed of light. So what's the really I can't sound that seems like the best I can do. Then if you'd agree with me that it's the unconscious, and it's not really unconscious, it's really just it has a different consciousness somewhere else, the I, the processor that I was talking about, the, the painter in your head, well, it's receiving the light. It's making sense of that light. Doesn't it logically have to be doing it at the speed of light to keep up with the light? <laughs> you following me? Yeah. yeah. And, and it's called in the quantum non-local function. That's something else, okay? So if it's going, so that means that that I is also not in time, outside time, whatever. Now, anecdotally, I can give you some evidence for this. Okay, and this is as far as I can take it, is if you could speak to a photon and imagine an exercise, and photons have ego consciousness, this consciousness, and you go, hey, Fody, what do you know about time? We go, huh, what? It's really kind of retarded. You know, you can't even talk about tomorrow or yesterday. It's stuck. The photon, the best you could find out from the photon, it's stuck where? It's stuck now. 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 That's all I would know is now. No past or present, just now. Where are you stuck? Where's your consciousness right now? Now. 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 We're trapped like the light. Now, our whole consciousness, everything, this is the observer and phenomena, as the Buddhist pointed out. Observer, phenomena are one and the same. And right away, 
up until this year, this is my 60th year, I hadn't really, I, mean, I hadn't really got, you know, well, it's epiphanies is what's an epiphany for me, is no longer is it poetry, the light of consciousness. There's got to be a deep meaning in there. That's all I'm suggesting to you. Okay? It's only boring to us, because we have clocks, you see. <laughs> but if you were a photon, you wouldn't, you would just think it goes straight through and there's no problem. You just go right through infinity and you come out the other side. So the picture I have, hard to, to understand because it's not common to think in these terms. You see, you think of size being important. But if you have this picture of geometry where big and small are equivalent, then this remote future can become equivalent to a Big Bang. Now, it's not our Big Bang because that would re lead you to paradoxes, sort of time travel issues which are difficult. It should be our beginning, it should be another beginning. It has to be the beginning of some other universe. So I call this, a, this the entire, from our Big Bang right to the remote future infinity, if you like, is what I call our eon. So that's one eon. Not the whole universe, it's only one eon of the universe. And the eon, of time, yeah. <laughs> it's it's an infinite amount of time, actually. Well, I looked up in the dictionary to see what the e word eon actually means. I was afraid it might mean a certain number of years, but it doesn't. It means it's some a very long period of time, and which is not defined. So I, I say it's infinite. <laughs> but it doesn't matter it being infinite, because the time scales away and becomes unimportant. But the direction of time still keeps going. So this remote, infinite universe becomes the Big Bang of the next universe, or the next eon, I should say. So our, our eon is but one of an infinite succession where they continue like this. Per quale motivo, professore, crede che la nostra coscienza, il nostro pensiero non sia eh, ripetibile, non sia simulabile all'interno di una macchina? Uh, why do you think some part of our consciousness cannot be simulated on a computer? Well, I've, for a long time, been worrying, or consciousness is a thing that interested my father very much. He was, he in fact worked on inheritance of mental conditions and so on. And so it was something, a subject which was of interest in our family. But uh, I think my attitude to what was going on, I, could, I would have perhaps for, if it hadn't been for this, I would have believed that we were all computers or something. That's a common view that people have these days. And, uh, but I learnt when I was in my first year at university, I think it was my first year, I, well, I went to courses on cosmology and quantum. I was doing pure mathematics, so these were things I did for fun. And one thing I went to was a course on logic. And I learned about Gödel's famous theorem and Turing's ideas about what are called Turing machines, idealized computers. And it became clear from my understanding of these lectures that our understanding of what's true in mathematics is not governed by rules. And whatever rules you lay down, you can always transcend those rules. If you accept the rules, you can see how to go beyond them. And this is amazing. I didn't, it's really hard to see this. You could say, okay, maybe all we do is believe these axioms and these rules, and that's all we do. And then Gödel says, no, no, you have to believe this too. If you believe those rules, you must believe this other thing, which is beyond the rules. So what's going on, you see? If it was, and this rules Turing in his idea of a computing machine showed, you know, idealized what, what rules mean and what it is to follow a computation. And this, this is a way, somehow it shows that the mind in our understanding, whatever understanding means, is not something you can encapsulate in a computation. So this idea had been with me for many years and although I am a person who believes that whatever goes on in our heads is something which is according to the physical laws, so there's not something outside physics. But what is physics? See, physics, if it is a physics that follows the rules of computation, okay, well then I'm stuck. But if there's something more in physics, then maybe that more is going on in our heads. And it seemed to me quite early on, in those days when I was a graduate student, that the biggest gap in our physical understanding is in quantum mechanics. It's not just that quantum mechanics is mysterious and hard to understand. Quantum mechanics is basically inconsistent. I mean, you follow one rule, which is Schrodinger's equation, 
and you suddenly change and you do something completely different. Whenever you make a measurement, you say, okay, we've done enough with you, Schrodinger, let's bring in the, this measurement thing. And I couldn't see how can you change the rules in the middle, that's cheating, you see. But that's how you do quantum mechanics. It's not that it's hard to understand, it's just inconsistent. And with, you know, with my mathematical, mathematical background, I don't like things which are inconsistent. So it seems to me quantum mechanics is not the final answer. And I was gratified to see that three of the major um, proponents, uh, originators of quantum mechanics, Einstein, Schrodinger, and Dirac even, <laughs> thought that qu quantum mechanics as we understand it now is not the final answer. There needs to be some improvement on the theory. And if there is a big gap, maybe that big gap is not a computational thing. There is something outside computation. Well, I'd believe this for many years before I wrote my book. Given this one equation, it's natural to ask, so what can you do with this? How predictive is it? Does it predict human level intelligence? Does it predict artificial intelligence? So I'm going to show you now a video that will, I think, demonstrate some of the amazing applications of just this single equation. Recent research in cosmology has suggested that universes that produce more disorder, or entropy, over their lifetimes should tend to have more favorable conditions for the existence of intelligent beings such as ourselves. But what if that tentative cosmological connection between entropy and intelligence hints at a deeper relationship? What if intelligent behavior doesn't just correlate with the production of long-term entropy, but actually emerges directly from it? To find out, we developed a software engine called Entropica, designed to maximize the production of long-term entropy of any system that it finds itself in. Amazingly, Entropica was able to pass multiple animal intelligence tests, play human games, and even earn money trading stocks, all without being instructed to do so. Here are some examples of Entropica in action. Just like a human standing upright without falling over, here we see Entropica automatically balancing a pole using a cart. This behavior is remarkable in part because we never gave Entropica a goal. It simply decided on its own to balance the pole. This balancing ability will have applications for humanoid robotics and human assistive technologies. Just as some animals can use objects in their environments as tools to reach into narrow spaces, here, we see that Entropica, again, on its own initiative, was able to move a large disk representing an animal around so as to cause a small disk, representing a tool, to reach into a confined space holding a third disk and release the third disk from its initially fixed position. This tool use ability will have applications for smart manufacturing and agriculture. In addition, just as some other animals are able to cooperate by pulling opposite ends of a rope at the same time to release food, here we see that Entropica is able to accomplish a model version of that task. This cooperative ability has interesting implications for economic planning and a variety of other fields. Entropica is broadly applicable to a variety of domains. For example, here we see it successfully playing a game of Pong against itself, illustrating its potential for gaming. Here we see Entropica orchestrating new connections on a social network where friends are constantly falling out of touch and successfully keeping the network well connected. This same network orchestration ability also has applications in healthcare, energy, and intelligence. Here we see Entropica directing the paths of a fleet of ships, successfully discovering and utilizing the Panama Canal to globally extend its reach from the Atlantic to the Pacific. By the same token, Entropica is broadly applicable to problems in autonomous defense, logistics, and transportation. Finally, here we see Entropica spontaneously discovering and executing a buy-low-sell-high strategy on a simulated range-traded stock, successfully growing assets under management exponentially. This risk management ability will have broad applications in finance and insurance. So what you've just seen is that a variety of signature human intelligent cognitive behaviors, such as tool use, and walking upright and social cooperation all follow from a single equation which drives a system to maximize its future freedom of action. Now, there's a profound irony here. Going back to the beginning of the usage of the term robot, the play RUR, R-U-R, there was always a concept that if we developed machine intelligence 
there would be a cybernetic revolt. The machines would rise up against us. One major consequence of this work is that maybe all of these decades, we've had the whole concept of cybernetic revolt in reverse. It's not that machines first become intelligent and then megalomaniacal and try to take over the world. It's quite the opposite, that the urge to take control of all possible futures is a more fundamental principle than that of intelligence, that general intelligence may in fact emerge directly from this sort of control grabbing rather than vice versa. Another important consequence is goal seeking. I'm often asked, how does the ability to seek goals follow from this sort of framework? And the answer is, the ability to seek goals will follow directly from this in the following sense. Just like you would travel through a tunnel, a bottleneck in your future path space in order to achieve many other diverse objectives later on, or just like you would invest in a financial security reducing your short-term liquidity in order to increase your wealth over the long-term, goal-seeking emerges directly from a long-term drive to increase future freedom of action. Finally, Richard Feynman, famous physicist, once wrote that if human civilization were destroyed and you could pass only a single concept onto our descendants to help them rebuild civilization, that concept should be that all matter around us is made out of tiny elements that attract each other when they're far apart, but repel each other when they're close together. My equivalent of that statement, to pass on to descendants to help them build artificial intelligences or to help them understand human intelligence is the following. Intelligence should be viewed as a physical process that tries to maximize future freedom of action and avoid constraints in its own future. Thank you very much. So what message should we take home from this? Um, I'd like to draw up a set of rules that we might refer to with respect to smart clothing in biological systems. Any type of color appearance that we can perceive is usually already evolved and has been presented to us in these biological systems. It encompasses order, quasi-order and disorder, along some sort of curious sliding scale of that structure. The fact that these biological materials can just grow is remarkable and is something that we must surely aspire towards. The take home message from today that I, that I uh, often try to, at the end of a, a day at home, get home from work and we do bath time and reading time and dinner time and I tuck the kids in, what did you enjoy today? What did you learn today is often what I try to bring home. Well, the key message today, the tuck-in message, if you will, is that these biological systems tolerate imperfection with respect to the mechanisms generating their appearance. And that fault tolerance is a remarkable quality that surely we must try to, to chase. Finally, lots of ginormous houses. Well, it's been around for 2,500 years. It's called pleaching, or grafting trees together, or grafting inosculate matter into one contiguous vascular system. And we do something different than what we did in the past. We add a, a kind of a modicum of intelligence to that. We use C and C to make scaffolding, to train semi-epithetic matter plants into a specific geometry that makes a home that we call a fab tree hat. It fits into the environment. It is the environment. It is the landscape. Right? And you can have a hundred million of these homes, and it's great because they suck carbon, right? They're perfect. You can have a hundred million families or sub take things out of the suburbs because these are homes that are a, a part of the environment. Imagine pre-growing a village, right? It takes about seven to ten years, and everything is green, right? So not only do we do, do, we do the veggie house, we also do uh, uh, the in vitro meat habitat or homes that we're doing research on now uh, in Brooklyn, where as an architecture office, we're the first of its kind to put in a molecular cell biology lab and start experimenting with regenerative medicine and tissue engineering and start thinking about what the future would be if architecture and biology became one. 
So we've been doing this for a couple of years, and that's our lab. And what we do is we grow extracellular matrix from pigs. We use a modified inkjet printer, and we print geometry. We print geometry where we can make industrial design objects, right? Like uh, you know, shoes, leather belts, handbags, etc., uh, where no sentient creature is harmed. It's victimless. It's meat from a test tube. So our theory is that eventually we should be, we should be doing this with homes. So here is a typical stud wall in uh, architectural construction, and this is a section of our proposal for a meat house, where you can see we use fatty cells as insulation, cilia for dealing with wind loads, and sphincter muscles for the doors and windows. Found. What they had in common was a sense of courage. And I want to separate courage and bravery for you for a minute. Courage, the original definition of courage, when it first came into the English language, it's from the Latin word cur, meaning heart. And the original definition was to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. And so these folks had, very simply, the courage to be imperfect. They had the compassion to be kind to themselves first and then to others, because as it turns out, we can't practice compassion with other people if we can't treat ourselves kindly. And the last was they had connection, and this was the hard part, as a result of authenticity. They were willing to let go of who they thought they should be in order to be who they were, which is you have to absolutely do that for connection. The other thing that they had in common was this. They fully embraced vulnerability. They believed that what made them vulnerable made them beautiful. They didn't talk about vulnerability being comfortable, nor did they really talk about it being excruciating, as I had heard earlier in the shame interviewing. They just talked about it being necessary. They talked about the willingness to say, I love you first. The willingness to do something where there are no guarantees. The willingness to breathe through waiting for the doctor to call after your mammogram. The willing to invest in a relationship that may or may not work out. They thought this was fundamental. I personally thought it was betrayal. Um, I could not believe I had pledged allegiance to research. Where our job, you know, the definition of research is to control, control and predict, to study phenomenon for the, reason, for the ex explicit reason to control and predict. And now my very, you know, my mission to control and predict had turned up the answer that the way to live is with vulnerability and to stop controlling and predicting. This or stress response wants you to be surrounded by people who care about you. Okay, so how is knowing this side of stress going to make you healthier? Well, oxytocin doesn't only act on your brain, it also acts on your body. And one of its main roles in your body is to protect your cardiovascular system from the effects of stress. It's a natural anti-inflammatory. It also helps your blood vessels stay relaxed during stress. But my favorite effect on the body is actually on the heart. Your heart has receptors for this hormone. And oxytocin helps heart cells regenerate and heal from any stress-induced damage. This stress hormone strengthens your heart. And the cool thing is, is that all of these physical benefits of oxytocin are enhanced by social contact and social support. So when you reach out to others under stress, either to seek support or to help someone else, you release more of this hormone, your stress response becomes healthier, and you actually recover faster from stress. I find this amazing that your stress response has a built-in mechanism for stress resilience. And that mechanism is human connection. I want to finish by telling you about one more study. And listen up, because this study could also save a life. This study tracked about 1,000 adults in the United States, and they ranged in age from 34 to 93. And they started the study by asking, how much stress have you experienced in the last year? They also asked, 
How much time have you spent helping out friends, neighbors, people in your community? And then they use public records for the next five years to find out who died. Okay, so the bad news first. <laughs> For every major stressful life experience, like financial difficulties or family crisis, that increased the risk of dying by 30%. But, and I hope you are expecting a but by now, but that wasn't true for everyone. People who spent time caring for others showed absolutely no stress-related increase in dying, zero. Caring created resilience. And so we see once again that the harmful effects of stress on your health are not inevitable. How you think and how you act can transform your experience of stress. When you choose to view your stress response as helpful, you create the biology of courage. And when you choose to connect with others under stress, you can create resilience. Now, I wouldn't necessarily ask for more stressful experiences in my life, but this science has given me a whole new appreciation for stress. Stress gives us access to our hearts, the compassionate heart that finds joy and meaning in connecting with others, and yes, your pounding physical heart working so hard to give you strength and energy. And when you choose to view stress in this way, you're not just getting better at stress, you're actually making a pretty profound statement. You're saying that you can trust yourself to handle life's challenges. And you're remembering that you don't have to face them alone. Thank you. Thank you. Love 2.0 describes that energizing micro moment that you feel when you truly connect with someone else. You meet eyes and you share a common source of positivity. Now, whether that emerges between you and your soulmate or you and a complete stranger, it provides powerful nourishment for your growth and your health. This book started as my data drew me to rethink love from the ground up. I've been studying positive emotions for decades, yet my latest data were telling me that the positivity that you feel when you're connecting with others nourishes you more than any other source of positivity. You're going to help us. You can read all you want about having a better love life, and it's not going to work. Is that right? That's very true. Uh, reading and getting self-help advice all impacts the thinking brain, but it doesn't impact the emotional brain very much at all. And really what impacts the emotional brain is the experience of relatedness, or the experience of being with somebody. So that's actually what changes people. And self-help advice, as well-meaning as it's intended to be, and even if it's very good advice, is not going to change anybody in a lasting way. Now, I know you're a scientist rather than one of these self-help people, but assume for one second that I am interested in uh, a better relationship. I'm convinced of the uh, salutary effects that it will have on my health and my well-being. And, uh, but as you've also pointed out, relationships aren't easy. They mm -hmm. need work. What do I do? Just spend more time with the individual and then over time my brain will find the right rhythm? Or am I just kind of doomed to muddle along? Well, it depends, of course, on you in an individual sense, what you're doing in the relationship, how well you're performing. Let's say like if it were a tennis game, it depends on both your skill level and your partner's skill mm -hmm. level. The, uh, and sometimes you can coax your partner to a greater skill level, and sometimes they can teach you uh, better things. There certainly are times when you would have to conclude, well, this person just is not up to the task of relating. Well, I was going to ask you, can, can you love practically anyone? No I, no, I don't think so. Some people are not good enough at it, uh, first of all, so that they're just like, can you play tennis with practically anyone? No. Some people hit the ball into the net every time. And it's very unsatisfying to play with them, and eventually you give up. But there's also an element of um, specificity. Because what people uh, notice, which is very interesting, is that out of all the people in the world, out of all the six billion people there are, there's actually relatively few that people are interested in pursuing, mm -hmm. uh, kind of attracted or drawn yeah. to. Even out of those people, there's very few that people 
even out of that selective set. Really connected. It's even narrower that, that people have a long-term successful connection. Why is that? Well, it's partly because in childhood, we learn to speak the emotional language of our parents in a sense, that they teach us how relationships work and how they ought to function, and we absorb that knowledge, and even though we're without realizing it, we may not know it, we may not even know that we've learned anything, and when we go out into the world, we gravitate towards people who know the same thing that we do, who speak our same emotional language. Now, among uh, other heresies that are uh, exploded in, in the book <laughs> is therapy. I mean, everyone goes, not everyone, many of us go to therapists in order to improve our love life. And you're saying that, again, therapy doesn't work, or if it does, certainly not the way we expect it to work. Well, therapy certainly can work, and it can be powerful some, for some people, but not in the way that most therapists, including most patients, think about it. Because um, if you realize that a relationship is really this biological, physiologic link between two emotional brains, then you, suddenly therapy appears in a whole new light. It's not just two people talking to one another, having a conversation. It's really this wireless emotional link, and what's being performed in the therapy should be an experience of relatedness that's different than what the person experiences outside. And that's really the, the changing aspect of theory, or the, the mutative aspect of therapy, is that new relationship, not, uh, say, uh, any particular insights right. or any particular intellectual knowledge. So, so it's knowledge. not the content of the therapy, per se, that may be helping. It's the fact that over time you might become more like the therapist. Precisely. Which is stable and reasonable and... Precisely. If you have a stable, reasonable therapist. Right. Therapy, right. Not everybody right. does. But people probably ought to be aware of that and ought to try and choose their therapist with a lot of care and discrimination because essentially you're asking to become more like that person. So relationship grows. It's an organic thing. It takes sometimes a very long time for it to, uh, uh, to be real, for trust, safety, and security to exist. Now, as soon as that exists, the traumatized person will remember and grieve as soon as the person feels safe. You don't have to have tricks. You don't have to have methods. It happens automatically. That's what the human spirit does. If I don't have to be in survival mode, then I will remember and grieve, because grieving is the natural human response to irretrievable, irreconcilable loss. You know, you've been screwed. You've been ripped off. Face it. You can only say that when there is a container of safety, security, and trust. So the other two phases we don't have to worry about. Now I think MDMA, for example, since it's an empathogen, it opens one's heart, it presents one. For the first time, some people feel no shame. Victims usually feel more shame than the perpetrators. So here is a substance that suddenly, for the first time in your life, makes you experience what it's like to be with another human being and not feel ashamed. Opens your heart and you see, you have empathy for the, for the other person, the therapist. And if the therapist is genuinely harmless, genuinely harmless, if the therapist really deeply knows that I am not going to do anything to you, no matter what, then that communicates in that state to the other. And for someone for whom it may take three to five years to trust the therapist, actually feel safe and trust the therapist within an hour. And that's unforgettable. Uh, MDMA is not like LSD where there is state-specific memory. A lot of things I learned uh, in the LSD state, I forgot when I came into ordinary state of consciousness, only remembered when I went back to it. That's like a drunk. Sometimes we'll only remember what happened last night when he gets drunk again. It's not so with MDMA. Whatever you really learn and realize, it's permanent. It stays with you. Now, that doesn't mean that later on you don't have to work on freeing yourself of habits that you have uh, uh, shackled yourself with in order to survive. So it's not the end of the line, but uh, the therapeutic alliance deepens and the container in which the person can uh, flourish um, uh, is real. So 
I think that all these things have to occur to the future psychedelic therapist. Uh, can't just say, well, I know this exists, I know this is how it should go, but I myself never experienced it. Like, that wouldn't be convincing. Um, what would be counterindication, either for uh, a, a selecting a therapist or a patient? Uh, I, I just want to uh, give you one example, which is, uh, uh, if I suspect that somebody is in such a mess in their life that um, there is such responsibility on their shoulders, they are so stressed that they might take the occasion as an option to never resume their life as their life was before. That is to basically commit suicide through LSD or MDMA. Basically. Uh, deciding that there is the chance to decide I won't I don't want to come back uh, uh, I'm going to go crazy if I have a sense an intuition that somebody might use the occasion for this kind of um, uh, escape from their lives then I postpone doing uh, uh, psychedelics with them until their life changes, until, uh, until there is some indication that they want to go back into their life. Um, I'll close by saying uh, the very first time I met R.D. Lang was in Vancouver. Uh, he was talking to professionals and he asked the question of, are you a healer uh, because uh, uh, you are or is it an ego trip? for you. Uh, is it, uh, you know, be, being a therapist, uh, being a healer, uh, gives you a certain kind of power. Is it, are you here because uh, of an ego trip? At that time, that was in 1974, I didn't know. So that's why I went over to England and worked with him to figure it out. I asked him how to become a healer. He said, either you're born one or you have to apprentice with one. Well, I chose to apprentice. Thank you. One way to change our genes is to make new ones, as Craig Venter has so elegantly shown. Another is to change our lifestyles. And what we're learning is how powerful and dynamic these changes can be, that you don't have to wait uh, very long to see the benefits. When you eat healthier, manage stress, exercise, and love more, your brain actually gets more blood flow and more oxygen. But more than that, your brain gets measurably bigger. Things that were thought impossible just a few years ago can actually be measured now. This was a... Uh, uh, figured out by Robin Williams a few years before the rest of us. <laughs> now, there's some uh, things that you can do to make your brain grow new brain cells. Some of my favorite things like chocolate and tea, blueberries, uh, alcohol in moderation, stress management, and cannabinoids found in marijuana. Um, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what were we just talking about? Um, and uh, other things that can make it worse, it can cause you to lose brain cells, the usual suspects like saturated fat and sugar, nicotine, opiates, cocaine, too much alcohol, and chronic stress. Your skin gets more blood flow when you change your lifestyle, so you age less quickly, your skin doesn't wrinkle as much, your heart gets more blood flow. We've shown that you can actually reverse heart disease, that these clogged arteries that you see in the upper left, after only a year, become measurably less clogged. And the cardiac PET scan shown in the lower left, the blue means no blood flow, a a year later, orange and white is maximal blood flow. We've shown you may be able to stop or reverse the progression of early prostate cancer by extension, breast cancer, simply by making these changes. We found that tumor growth in vitro was inhibited 70% in the group that made these changes, whereas only 9% in the comparison group. These differences were highly significant. Even your sexual organs get more blood flow, so you increase sexual potency. Uh, one of the most effective anti-smoking ads was done by the Department of Health Services showing that uh, <laughs> nicotine, which constricts your arteries, can cause a a heart attack or a stroke, but it also causes impotence. Half of guys who smoke are impotent. How sexy is that? 
Now, we're about to publish two new studies, one in collaboration with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who won a Lasker Prize a couple of years ago for discovering telomerase. Telomerase is an enzyme that repairs telomeres, which are the ends of your chromosomes that control how long you live, obviously pretty important. And what we showed is that simply in just three months, by making these simple changes, you can actually increase your telomerase, thereby lengthening your telomeres and living longer. And we're also about to publish a study, the first study showing you can change gene expression in men with prostate cancer. This is what's called a heat map, and the different colors, and along the side on the right are different genes. And we found that over 500 genes were favorably uh, changed, in effect turning on the good genes, the disease-preventing genes, turning off the disease-promoting genes. And so these, these findings, I think, are really very powerful. They're giving many people new hope and new choices. And companies like uh, Navigenics and DNA Direct and 23andMe that are giving you your genetic profiles are getting some people a sense of, gosh, well, what can I do about it? Well, our genes are not our fate, and if we make these changes, they're a predisposition. But if we make bigger changes than we might have made otherwise, we can actually change how our genes are expressed. Thank you. Anything that creates a sense of trust leads to intimacy, leads to healing and meaning. Even the word healing comes from the root to make whole, yoga, to yoke, to unite, to bring together. These are old ideas that we're rediscovering. And you find this as part of all spiritual traditions, altruism, compassion, forgiveness, and love. Not to get some external reward in the next lifetime, but that's what frees us from our isolation and our depression and our suffering here and now. Uh, my dad died a few months ago. My mom had a stroke, a debilitating stroke shortly thereafter. My dog of 14 years got bit on the nose by a rattlesnake. This is on the last few months and died. You know, life is short and life is precious. And what I'm most interested in is not simply unclogging arteries or showing all these kinds of things as interesting as they are, because we're all going to die. The mortality rate is still, you know, 100%. It's one per person, you know. <laughs> I, I got profoundly and suicidally depressed when I was in college. That was my doorway into this area. For someone else, it might be a heart attack or a stroke. But, you know, change is hard, as Adam mentioned earlier. But when you're in enough pain, suddenly the idea of change becomes more interesting. And what I find most passionate, what I'm most passionate about and what I find most interesting is how we can use the experience of suffering as a doorway for transforming our lives and finding meaning. And then we can often get curing, but we can always get healing. Thank you so much. Anyway, suggesting we shouldn't optimize what Western medicine has to offer. I'm just saying it's not enough. We need to not stop there. It's not enough just to, to take the medicine or even to eat a pristine diet and exercise regularly and take your vitamins. That we have to, we have to take the next step to figure out how to reduce our stress responses and increase our relaxation responses so that the body can do what it does best, heal itself. So I want to leave you with a quote. This is from Dr. Albert Schweitzer. And he says, the doctor he said, hang on, I gotta get this right. I'm bad at quotes. He says, I wanna tell you a little secret. We doctors, we do nothing. We only help and empower the doctor within. So I encourage you to be that doctor. Every one of you has the power to be the doctor within. Thank you very much. The more it's become very clear that placebo treatments involve the activation of multiple neurotransmitters, including such, such neuro, uh, neurotransmitters as endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and cannabinoids. In the field of neuroscience, it's become common to compare the brain to a prediction machine. It looks like, from our, our work right now, that the, um, the implicit suggestions and the um, environmental cues of healthcare prompt changes in neurobiology, which cause shifts in a patient's sensory experiences and self awareness. That's, um, well, okay, that's good enough on that. And the, uh, so the third question I want to ask oh, the third question does it make any difference? This is important. Does this have any value at all? Well, first, uh, um, it's clear that placebo effects are real. It's clear there's a neurobiology. And it's likely that placebos account for a significant portion of the relief patients experience in healthcare environments. I remember what I was thinking about. Is it important? 
Oh, this is especially important in illnesses where the, uh, in many conditions, where the placebo, where the drugs that we use are only marginally better than the placebo effect. And there's a lot of illnesses like that. Um, we obviously need new drugs and, and better drugs. But it's clear we, ca we can't afford to not um, opt harness the placebo effect in that clinical situation. Furthermore, um, um, placebos are important even in situations where drugs are very powerful. For example, an injection of opioids in front of a patient, full view, in full view, Dr. Needle goes in, those opioids are dramatically more effective in pain relief than if the same amount of opioids are given to a patient through an IV without the patient knowing they're, they're getting it. And placebo effect. Look at the uh, readout uh, of a gene called the reading gene. So this is the, the ticker tape of a reading gene, let's say. I say, well, what does epigenetics do? Well, I say epigenetics can alter that reading gene by cutting and pasting. So I can cut off part and make the read gene. I can cut off part, make the ding gene. I could cut off parts and make the add gene. And every time I'm doing that, I'm using the same blueprint, but I'm creating a new protein out of it. So what's the point? And the issue is simply this. For every gene in your body, using epigenetics, I can create greater than 3,000 different versions of the same protein. Some of those versions are healthy versions, and some of those versions are the equivalent of mutant versions. So a matter of fact, you don't have to have a mutant gene. You could have a mutant readout. Epigenetics could take a normal gene and turn it into a gene that reads as a cancer gene. And that's why we're beginning to find out a very important point. Cancer is only about 10% connected to heredity, 90% connected to the environment and your response. And the relevance, as you're quite aware, is simply this. If the signals from the environment are controlling the genetics, then I'm not a victim of my genes. If you wanted to say you were a victim of your environment, you could say that, but that's not true because of a simple reason. You can change the environment. You can change your response to life. You can change all these. All of a sudden, the concept that you are a victim of your DNA is completely false. You are the master of your DNA. It's your perceptions that send signals to the genes. It's your emotions that send signals to the genes. It's the environment that you live in sends signals to the genes. And all of a sudden you realize, yeah, but I can change my emotions, I can change my perceptions, I can change my environment. And all of a sudden you realize, yeah, you are not restricted to a specific gene readout. You are free to change anything in your life. And this becomes very critical because you have to have self-empowerment. And matters to the brain. Have you heard of rumination? It's the habit of dwelling on our negative thoughts repeatedly at length. It ramps up our brain's stress circuitry, and that in turn interferes with the whole process of memory consolidation. It's, it's the big reason why memory tends, tends to suffer whenever we're stressed and we get trapped inside our own heads. And the research shows we're most likely to ruminate whenever we're completely alone. On the other hand, FaceTime with our loved ones, it doesn't just protect us against toxic rumination it also directly puts the brakes on the brain's stress response. And the benefits can range from lower anxiety to better quality sleep to, yes, better memory. Now, whenever we hear the term chemical imbalance, most of us, I think, reflexively assume medication must be the answer. And yet the relevant neuroscience leads us to a somewhat different conclusion. There are many different ways of changing neurochemistry. Most of them have nothing to do with medication. It's why I believe in the long run, the most effective way of balancing neurochemistry is to balance our lives. Remember, experience changes the brain. Thank you. Whenever you have an experience, you devote more of your brain to processing that. And so when you get something, be it academic or sports or music or a thought, it's just that, that connection is now strong. Now an important point here is all experiences change the brain. 
So when you're in a college class and you learn some, some fact, you've changed the brain. But also the whole college's experience is affecting the brain. College are often under, students are often under great pressure. Uh, they're often overtired. And this also changes the brain. When you're under high stress and fatigue, what happens is something called downshifting. Downshifting. You shift down to a more primitive, primitive style of functioning where the back part of your brain here, which is your concrete sensory area, talks to the motor system, and that's it. You're in a more of a stimulus response mode. Someone comes up and says, your hair doesn't look very good today, and you get really angry at them. You don't have to get angry at them. They may be making a joke. What's happening is under stress and fatigue, or maybe your hair doesn't look good. Some people don't have to worry about it. <laughs> under stress, under fatigue, what happens is this front part of the brain here, this is the CEO of the brain. This is where David Lynch is in your brain. <laughs> this is the director. All other parts of the brain send their information to the front. It gets integrated. It's sent back out. Under high stress, these connections are not used. And when you actually, sorry, when you actually have connections at this part of the brain and someone comes up and makes a comment about your hair, you say, oh, you didn't get a good sleep last night, or it's a joke, or he thinks I'm somebody else. You're not, resp you're not responding to the surface value of that relationship. You can see more fundamental to it. Now, what does happen over time under high stress and fatigue is this area, the, the CEO of the brain, is just not involved in usual experience. And that's what this picture is of. These are people lying down. This is their spinal cord, so their feet are coming out at you. You're looking up at the top of their brain. This is where the eyes are. And this, these are both during eyes closed rest. And what we're looking at is brain metabolic rate. Now, this Swiss cheese you see over here, they're not really holes here, but these are areas, these are functional lesions. That is, these parts of the brain are not involved in whatever you're doing. What this means is that you can, and this, this is, by the way, a very violent individual. It's a criminal. It's not a college student. <laughs> but high... <laughs> Um, high drinking, high stress, um, mental stress, physical stress results in this. The brain is constantly being rewired. So you may be wondering what can strengthen these frontal connections and transcending does this. It actually directly exercises the frontal area. It makes it alive. It connects it with the other parts of the brain. When One is to take advantage of this incredible gift that has come with the newest part of the brain. So, you know, the brain has old parts and new parts, right? Uh, the old part, the reptilian brain, as we call it, in, in the back of the brain, that's 400 million years old. That's fight or flight, survive, uh, feed, uh, reproduce, etc. The 300 million year old area of the brain, the limbic brain, the emotional brain, that's where the emotions of fear and desire uh, are serving that instinctive brain making sure that the species keeps going. And, and embedded in that emotional area is also short-term memory. But then you have this new area of the brain, the frontal cortex or the neocortex. It's only 4 million years old. And there you have reason, planning, judgment. But I think more importantly, you have the ability to apply meaning to life, purpose to life. You can ask, why am I here? You can have empathy for others. You can have imagination, creativity. And this is a relatively new area of the brain that showed up in mammals and has been really highly evolved in us. That same area of the brain gives us the ability to be self-aware. So, for example, let's say something terrible happens and you're really sad and your emotional brain is pumping out those signals to be sad. At the same time that you're sad or you feel sad, you can know you're sad, right? Think about when you're a kid. I mean, when you're a kid, you, you go through these, at least I did, you know, you can, be, you can be in big trouble with your parents, and you feel, you feel terrible. But then you can also step back and, and say, I know I feel terrible right now, right? And, and, and displace yourself from it, detach from it. As we get older, that gets more difficult. So self-awareness allows you to be uh, aware of, of what's going on in your brain. Now, I want to make a really profound, I, I think, profound point here. That it's, and if you get it, I think it's really interesting and it's something to think about.
your brain brings you four basic things, right? Your brain delivers to you your sensations, including images. It brings you feelings. It brings you thoughts. So sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. And Dan Siegel, the great neuropsychiatrist at UCLA, calls it SIFT, S-I-F-T. That's what your brain delivers you. Now, when you see a red car going down the road, you say, I see a red car. But you don't say, I am the red car. You know your brain, there's, there's photons hitting your eyes, receptors are bringing images to your brain. Your brain processes that information and provides for you an image of a red car. Your brain produces for you the image of a red car based on light that's hitting your uh, receptors in your eyes. But you see the car, and you don't say, I am a red car. But now let's take another example. Something out in the outside world happens, you're disappointed, someone says something that hurts you, makes you feel sad. And your brain is bringing you sadness in response to an outside event. And quickly, you readily say, I am sad. We make the argument that when something happens outside to make you feel sad, it's just as ludicrous to say, I am sad, as it is to say, I am a red car, when your brain brings you the image of a red car. Your brain delivers to you sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. It's doing you a service. When you become, as we say in Superbrain, the user of the brain and, and exercise your self-awareness, you observe your feelings. So if suddenly you feel sad, you say, okay, my brain's making me feel sad right now, or I'm feeling sad right now. Learn from it, but then don't identify with it. As soon as you identify with negative emotions, you become them, and you are shortchanging yourself. You're basically imprisoning yourself in that emotion. And then later on, you, even when you get over it, later on you're going to be traumatized, and you're going to have what's called a limiting belief system. Limiting beliefs means something happens, and you, you want to do something. You're thinking, oh, okay, I want to go achieve this, achieve that. I want to, you know, whatever it is you're interested in, a hobby or, or at work or a sport, uh, I want to hit a home run in baseball. Okay, but then something inside says, no, I can't do it. These limiting beliefs, these negative belief systems become ingrained as you identify with negative emotions based on events. So when new events happen that trigger those old memories, you have all these limiting beliefs about what you can do. If you want to remove those limiting beliefs, you basically don't identify with the negative emotion. The book is super brain. The thing to understand about shame is it's not guilt. Shame is a focus on self, guilt is a focus on behavior. Shame is, I am bad, guilt is, I did something bad. How many of you, if you did something that was hurtful to me, would be willing to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake? How many of you would be willing to say that? Guilt, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Shame, I'm sorry, I am a mistake. There is a huge difference between shame and guilt. And here's what you need to know. Shame is highly, highly correlated with addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, suicide, eating disorders. And here's what you even need to know more. Guilt, inversely correlated with those things. The ability to hold something we've done or failed to do up against who we want to be is incredibly adaptive. It's uncomfortable, but it's adaptive. The other thing you need to know about shame is it's absolutely organized by gender. If shame washes over me and washes over Chris, it's going to feel the same. Everyone sitting in here knows the warm wash of shame. We're pretty sure that the only people who don't experience shame are people who have no capacity for connection or empathy. Which means, yes, I have a little shame, no, I'm a sociopath. So I would opt for, yes, you have a little shame. Shame feels the same for men and women, but it's organized by gender. For women, the best example I can give you is Anjali, the commercial. I can put the wash on the line, pack the lunches, hand out the kisses, and be work at five to nine. I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan, and never let you forget you're a man. For women, shame is do it all, do it perfectly, and never let them see you sweat. I don't know how much perfume that commercial sold, but I guarantee you it moved a lot of antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds. <laughs> Shame for women is this web of unattainable, conflicting, competing expectations about who we're supposed to be. And it's a straitjacket 
For men, shame is not a bunch of competing, conflicting expectations. Shame is one. Do not be perceived as what? Weak. I did not interview men for the first four years of my study, and it wasn't until a man looked at me one day after a book signing and said, I love what you have to say about shame. I'm curious why you didn't mention men. And I said, I don't study men. And he said, that's convenient. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, because you say to reach out, tell our story, be vulnerable. But you see those books you just signed for my wife and my three daughters? I said, yeah. They'd rather me die on top of my white horse than watch me fall down. When we reach out and be vulnerable, we get the shit beat out of us. And don't tell me it's from our, the guys and the coaches and the dads. Because the women in my life are harder on me than anyone else. So I started interviewing men and asking questions. And what I learned is this. You show me a woman who can actually sit with a man in real vulnerability and fear, I'll show you a woman who's done incredible work. You show me a man who can sit with a woman who's just had it, she can't do it all anymore. And his first response is not, I unloaded the dishwasher. <laughs> But he really listens, because that's all we need. I'll show you a guy who's done a lot of work. Shame is an epidemic in our culture. And to get out from underneath it, to find our way back to each other, We have to understand how it affects us and how it affects the way we're parenting, the way we're working, the way we're looking at each other. Very quickly, some research by Mahalik at Boston College. He asked, what do women need to do to conform to female norms? The top answers in this country, nice, thin, modest, and use all available resources for appearance. <laughs> When he asked about men, what do men in this country need to do to conform with male norms? The answers were, always show emotional control, work is first, pursue status, and violence. If we're going to find our way back to each other, we have to understand and know empathy, because empathy is the antidote to shame. If you put shame in a Petri dish, it needs three things to grow exponentially, secrecy, silence, and judgment. If you put the same amount of shame in a Petri dish and douse it with empathy, it can't survive. The two most powerful words when we're in struggle, me too. And so I'll. In mind, if that was the source of the problem, then you're never ever going to find a solution where the solution has to do with you giving a description of someone else's mind, with you writing a textbook on someone else's mind, even if you're Virginia Woolf. But if, on the other hand, you view the problem in terms of your bodily sympathy, in terms of your capacity to be in a resonance with someone else, in terms of your nervous system being primed to be in the position, in the shape, in the bodily composition of the beings that you're around, then maybe, just maybe, you make progress on the mind-body problem in a way that was unthinkable to Descartes and Elizabeth. So I want to offer this idea, that the future of the mind-body problem is for you to reconfigure your expectations about what it means to know someone else's mental life, to know someone else's consciousness. Your expectation shouldn't be to have a description of someone else's mental life, but instead it should be an expectation to be in a kind of sympathy, a kind of resonance, a kind of knowing what it's like to be them because you are the same kind of being and because your nervous system is ready to be them. And this is going to be not based on some theory, not based on some story, not based on some scientific measurement. It's going to be from looking at the movement itself, understanding what it means to be in this push-pull relationship with the beings around you, even in a fake boxing match at the beginning of stop-motion photography, right? knowing something about what it's like to be in a kind of interaction with someone else. So I urge you to change your expectations about what it means to solve the mind-body problem. You won't solve it in terms of knowing some description of someone else's mind, 
but you might well know how they are. You might know not, well know how they are because you are the same way. You're made of the same stuff. And I think this is going to make a difference. I think this is going to reorient your political, social, cultural conception of yourself toward concepts that were always there too, or at least always should have been there too, alongside self and rationality and certainty and will. It's going to orient you around a different set of concepts, ones having to do with empathy, community, action, being with one another, understanding one another. Thanks for your time. Poems, for our perspective, from a shamanic perspective, is kind of a spiritual illness perspective. And I'm saying that that is manifested in limbic dysfunction. What do the shamans say is wrong? They say this person has accumulated too many dark energies, dark spirits, and that's what they're coming for is cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. Uh, so if we don't treat and clean these energies, the person gets sick. So what do we do? This is our maloka. We clean, we clean, we clean. So there is similar uh, ideas throughout all the traditional cultures. Actually, here I am with a Zulu Sangoma in South Africa recently. They do ritual bathing, plant baths, vapor treatments. They're all about ritual cleansing and cleaning, that that is a key to health. Do we have anything that parallels that in Western science? It turns out, yes, we do. In the psychoneurological world, we have this concept of allostatic burden and load. So it's basically that our stress response system, which is very well defined and described at this stage by psychoneuroimmunology, is burdened over time by accumulated stress, modified and sometimes overburdened and sometimes maladaptive. I'm going fast because I gotta go fast. So they have conditions, this is the kind of thing, it's just multiple stresses. You have, how do you measure allostatic load? They have a measurement. It's cortisol levels, uh, adrenaline levels, inflammatory markers. These are all links of the, of the immune system being overburdened by accumulated stress that's sitting and weighing on the system. PTSD, great example, okay, of an overburdened stress response system. Pretty clear. This is Russ, he came to, uh, down the center a while back, treated, got better. From the shamanic perspective, cleaning all the energies and the spirits of the war, that's what we did. So migraine, you know, is looked at as a maladaptive response to stress, injury to the stress coping mechanism. Again, chronic fatigue syndrome and highest allostatic load. You know, here we see it, taking shape and all these illnesses that kind of look kind of spiritual. Um, this childhood, you know, kids that will have their, their parents die. Here's all the measurements. Their HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary uh, adrenal axis stress response system is marked, okay? Uh, Psychoneuroimmunology is a study of all this. Here's the brain. It's all very well described. This is the autonomic nervous system, very well described, connected to the whole thing, connected to digestion, connected to erectile dysfunction and all these other emotionally related problems that are so everywhere, uh, connected to our emotions very directly. Uh, an expression of our subconscious body controlling our tears, our laughter, our digestion, our upset stomach, our nausea, our vomiting, our diarrhea. Sounds like an ayahuasca ceremony. <laughs> Here's the limbic system again. There's the hypothalamus sitting in the middle, heading up the stress response system in the HP axis. And if you go to these other talks, the psilocybin, there's a hypothalamus. There's other people, there it is. So accumulated energy, stress from childhood, maltreatment, psychological trauma, leads to increased allostatic load. Allostatic load represents maladaptive functioning in our psychoneurologic apparatus leaves us with less capacity, capacity to cope with stress, et cetera, et cetera. So then talk about stress response system for us. Ayahuasca in a proper ritual setting in Ikaros can be effective in cleaning accumulated stress damage, allostatic load burden, often resulting from emotional trauma. Epigenetics, I just want to touch on this. Epigenetics, the coding of the genes, okay? This is the coding of the genes, not the genes themselves. Very susceptible to lifestyle, nutrition, environmental toxicity, toxicity psychosocial stress. So now we see, and this is what gets imprinted Here's them. Oh, it looks like, where, where is the imprinting happening during maternal imprinting, childhood trauma? Oh, it looks like it's the epigenetics, you know? Attachment theory, these neglected monkeys, what's wrong with them? It's their epigenetics, you know? Early life adversity associated with broad scope of lifelong and health and behavioral disorders. The study examines whether randomized, blah, blah, blah. It's basically epigenetics, okay? That's what I want to tell you. There's, it's a growing thing, epigenetic mechanism of depression and antidepressant action. So I think we should explore the possibility that we at the Ayahuasca Healing Centers are cleaning allostatic load, pathologically imprinted epigenetics from our emotional centers, which, by the way, are hardwired into our tears and our, via, our vomit. Rapid limbic revision. That's what I want to say. And the last thing I just want to say is spiritual health, you know, where the rubber hits the road in embodied consciousness, you know, is the emotional health is there. And so we see that. And so 
I'm not, we, you know, Jack Mabit is going to get much more into the spiritual technologies as other people have talked about or what we do in shamanism and in technology, but in a way that the larger community is going to understand, emotional health is a place where that's marked. And our limbic system is there and the epigenetic imprinting of the limbic system is there. So I think this should be a focus of some research. It's, it's, it seems interesting to me. That's it. everyday greetings as one of the wonders of this world. Now those wonders run even deeper because when you really connect with another person, uh, a beautifully choreographed biological dance is unfolding um, as your smiles, gestures, and postures come to mirror one another and come into sync. But when you're really connecting with somebody else, your, um, your heart rhythms come into sync, your biochemistries come into sync, even your neural firings come into sync. It's as if in that micro moment, a single positive emotion is rolling across two brains and bodies at once, creating a momentary resonance of good feeling and goodwill between you. Now, what's more is that as you have more of these micro moments of connection in your daily life, it changes you. It, it changes you for the better, not just socially and psychologically, but also physically. And I've become particularly interested in your vagus nerve. Your vagus nerve emerges from your brain stem and tethers your brain to your heart. And one of its jobs is to slow your racing heart after a fright. But when your vagus nerve is functioning really well, it also slows your heart rate just a bit each time you exhale. Now, what happens in Vegas doesn't necessarily stay in Vegas. <laughs> uh, it radiates out to affect your health more generally. It reflects your body's ability to regulate inflammation it, uh, to regulate glucose as well as your heart rate. And it also establishes your biological capacity for connection. Now scientists used to think that your vagus nerve functioning was rather stable, kind of like your height once you're an adult. But what we've discovered is that if you find ways to increase your daily diet of these micro moments of connection each day, your vagus nerve functioning improves. The very rhythms of your heart become healthier. So these micro moments of connection are positive health behaviors every bit as much as eating your vegetables, eating your kale, or um, being physically active. But, um, and, and how much more enjoyable and easy is connecting than doing some of the other health behaviors that we need to do? And this isn't just about your health, because when you're really connecting with someone else, your heart is getting a mini tune-up, and so is theirs. So you are wired to connect, and what we're learning is that the vagus nerve is a key part of that wiring, but I don't want you to be thinking about this wiring as um, mechanical wiring that stays the same season to season. This is living tissue. Your vagus nerve is living tissue, and it changes season to season depending on your habits, your habits of connection. The more you connect, the more you fortify this wiring to connect, and the more you lower your odds of having a heart attack and increase your odds of living a long, happy, and healthy life. Now, this gives me goosebumps. I mean, we've hardly been giving these micro moments of connection their due. When we say we had rapport, or um, we really connected, or um, uh, sort of on the same page, we're in a way subtly suggesting that the goodness of our connection is somehow optional, icing on the cake. When these discoveries suggest that these connections are biological imperatives, uh, they give you life in the same way that the what makes this all the more poignant is that the, we know from the evidence that the causal arrow runs in both directions that the more of these micro moments of connection that we have, the more we improve our heart health, and our heart health establishes our, our capacity for connection. And this mutual influence sheds light on how a lack of positive connection can diminish you. Your heart's capacity for love obeys the biological law of use it or lose it. 
So choose it. Choose love. Stop waiting for the Cupid's arrow or the lightning bolt to choose you. Choose love. Choose to connect with the people in your midst. Uh, face to face, heart to heart, and smile to smile. The science is calling us to wake up to the life-giving power of these micro moments and take them more fully to heart. Choose love. Opportunities abound. Thank you. Applying quantum physics to biology, first by Erwin Schrodinger, who came up with Schrodinger's equation, Schrodinger's cat, Schrodinger's book, What is Life?, where he suggested that quantum effects play key roles uh, in living systems, and Schrodinger's proteins, which were proven in 2007, showing that proteins can be in quantum superposition of two or more different states at the same time. He suggested, and many of us have followed to suggest, that quantum features, non-local entanglement, superposition, unity, quantum coherence, quantum information, a kind of quantum vitalism, may play key roles in biological functions, such as cell division, mitosis, how the centrioles guide uh, the chromosome separations, which has to be perfect or else can lead to cancer. Healing. Uh, maybe have some kind of non-local component. And also consciousness. As Walter uh, mentioned, Roger Penrose and I have uh, developed a theory of consciousness called ORCOR. I don't have time to go into it now. It basically proposes quantum computation in brain neuron microtubules inside neurons. So rather than neuron-to-neuron -neuron communication, we're looking at a deeper level inside neurons to give a global sense of consciousness through quantum mechanics, which results in real-time causality and free will. We avoid the problem of epiphenomenal. It gives consciousness real-time control and a potential connection to fundamental space-time geometry, quantum space-time geometry, through Roger's objective reduction. This is consistent with Eastern spiritual traditions. Although Roger doesn't like to talk about it, I've taken the liberty of, uh, of observing the, the implications of what he said and what we've said for consciousness for Eastern uh, philosophy and, and other spiritual traditions. But skeptics said, well, living systems are too warm, wet, and noisy. Quantum coherence is destroyed by decoherence, decoherence. Uh, but in the last five years, multiple lines of evidence, starting with photosynthesis, have shown that quantum coherence occurs in warm biological systems routinely. And the, the plants, the food we eat, all depend on quantum coherence, plants absorbing photons, converting to chemical energy, utilizing quantum coherence. Also, recently, uh, Anurban Banyapati at the National Institute of Material Science in Japan has shown that there's megahertz coherence, quantum conductance, and topological qubits in microtubules at room temperature. Very exciting work. Uh, quantum biology papers, conferences are popping up like flowers in the spring. Sessions at the American Physical Society, recently at Google, the Google Workshop on Quantum Biology, and elsewhere. So, how is this going to save the world? Let's go back to our threats to the world and consider uh, the first one, overcrowding, hatred, wars, and terrorism. Now, that's a tough one. We'll save that for last. We'll come back to that. Okay, disease. Uh, Jeff mentioned a little bit about this, but if life is a quantum system, we can ask, how is quantum coherence optimized in a healthy state? We have a different endpoint to, to shoot for. We can consider disease as decoherence. Disease is a process that tends to destroy quantum uh, coherence, which is the optimal form of, of living systems. Also, uh, quantum biology say the world lack of food and energy. Highly efficient quantum conductance, uh, converting sunlight to chemical energy used in photosynthesis, which has been proven, should be uh, able to be emulated in substances like graphenes and fullerenes to revolutionize molecular agriculture and solar power. Uh, Mohamed Saravar, UC Berkeley, is, is working in this direction. He's uh, one of the people working in photosynthesis. Okay, pollution and warming. The same, the same answer, extremely efficient, clean solar energy with quantum conductance can uh, potentially uh, help us a lot in terms of pollution and warming. Okay, what about lack of purpose and meaning? Who are we and why are we here? Well, if quantum consciousness is correct, if, for example, the Pen, uh, Penrose idea is correct, we are literally ripples in the fine structure of space-time geometry. We are this mechanism that connects our brain to fundamental space-time geometry. So the idea is that as, as consciousness can actually go down in this hierarchical level. It's like a fractal going down a deeper level, higher intensity, uh, faster frequency, very much like the Beatles song, the deeper you go, the higher you fly, the higher you fly, the deeper you go. As you meditate or become uh, um, enlightened or whatever, 
uh, more conscious moments per second, and it's occurring at a deeper, deeper level of the universe. This is what I would call enlightenment. So, you want immortality. Let's go back to the question at the beginning. I think there are three choices. You can wait or hope for downloading into a computer, uh, as I showed earlier. Uh, uh, maybe believe this guy, Ray Kurzweil. I don't. I think, uh, I think the premise and, and the, uh, the basic uh, assumptions that they make of one neuron, one bit are completely wrong. And I keep telling Ray, you should simulate a paramecium before you simulate uh, a brain. Or you could wait or hope for downloading uh, consciousness into a bio biological array of microtubules, as I suggested in a book I wrote in 1987, uh, that uh, we could download our minds into uh, these centriole type structures where bing would occur, maybe even giant ones uh, floating uh, in zero gravity so that they could rotate. Or wait or hope for the old fashioned way. Because I think consciousness can actually exist in fundamental space time geometry, and so we may not need to download. It's kind of a spiritual idea, but I think there's a scientific rationale for believing that this actually occurs. So I think Bing goes all the way down. And in conclusion, let me just say that consciousness in the brain cannot be explained by modern science, uh, by conventional approaches. Uh, so they can't really say, well, that's silly to think that it can exist out of the brain, because they don't know. And quantum effects may connect brain activity to the most basic level of the universe. And finally, consciousness may indeed exist non-locally independent of biology, perhaps a greater depth, intensity, and being. Thank you very much. Same deal. A bunch of games, three levels of rewards. What happens? People offered the medium level of rewards, did no better than people offered the small rewards. But this time, people offered the highest rewards. They did worst of all. In eight of the nine tasks we examined across three experiments, higher incentives led to worse performance. Is this some kind of touchy-feely socialist conspiracy going on here? <laughs> no, these are economists from MIT, from Carnegie Mellon, from the University of Chicago. And do you know who sponsored this research? The Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. That's the American experience. Let's go across the pond to the London School of Economics. LSE, London School of Economics, alma mater of 11 Nobel laureates in economics. Training ground for great economic thinkers like George Soros and Friedrich Hayek and Mick Jagger. Last <laughs> month, just last month, economists at LSE looked at, at 51 studies of pay for performance plans inside of companies. Here's what the economists there said. We find that financial incentives can result in a negative impact on overall performance. There's a mismatch between what science knows and what business does. And what worries me as we stand here in the rubble of the economic collapse is that too many organizations are making their decisions, their, their, their policies about talent and people based on assumptions that are outdated, unexamined, and rooted more in folklore than in science. And if we really want to get out of this economic mess, and if we really want high performance on those definitional tasks of the 21st century, the solution is not to do more of the wrong things, to entice people with a sweeter carrot or threaten them with a sharper stick. We need a whole new approach. The good news about all this is that the scientists who've been studying motivation have given us this new approach. It's an approach built much more around intrinsic motivation, around the desire to do things because they matter, because we like it, because they're interesting, because they're part of something important. And to my mind, that new operating system for our businesses revolves around three elements. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy, the urge to direct our own lives. Mastery, the desire to get better and better at something that matters and purpose, the yearning to do what we do in the service of something larger than ourselves. These are the building blocks of an entirely new operating system for our businesses. I want to talk today only about autonomy. In the 20th century, we came up with this idea of management. Management did not emanate from nature. Okay? Management is an in, it's, it's, like, it's not a tree, it's a television set. Okay? Somebody invented it, and it doesn't mean it's going to work forever. Management is great. Traditional notions of management are great if you want compliance. But if you want engagement, self-direction works better. 
Let me give you some. But what bums me out is to know that a lot of kids today are just wishing to be happy, to be healthy, to be safe, not bullied, and be loved for who they are. So it seems to me when adults say, what do you want to be when you grow up? They just assume that you'll automatically be happy and healthy. But maybe that's not the case. Go to school, go to college, get a job, get married, boom. Then you'll be happy, right? We don't seem to make learning how to be happy and healthy a priority in our schools. It's separate from schools. And for some kids, it doesn't exist at all. But what if we didn't make it separate? What if we based education on the study and practice of being happy and healthy? Because that's what it is, a practice, and a simple practice at that. Education is important, but why is being happy and healthy not considered education? I just don't get it. So I've been studying the science of being happy and healthy. It really comes down to practicing these eight things. Exercise, diet and nutrition, time in nature, contribution service to others, relationships, recreation, relaxation and stress management, and religious or spiritual involvement. Yes, got that one. Um, <laughs> so these eight things come from Dr. Roger Walsh. He calls them therapeutic lifestyle changes, or TLCs for short. He's a scientist that studies how to be happy and healthy. In researching this talk, I got a chance to ask him a few questions like, do you think that our schools today are making these eight TLCs a priority? His response was no surprise. It was essentially no. But he did say that many people do try to get this kind of education outside of the traditional arena through reading and practices such as meditation or yoga. But what I thought was his best response was that much of education is oriented, for better or worse, towards making a living rather than making a life. Because most of your work, the limbic uh, brain, I mean, deals with emotion and how we relate to, to one another. Explain how that works for me. Well, when mammals first evolved, they had um, something of a difficult problem. Reptiles give birth to eggs, which don't need any care. But mammals give birth to live, helpless animals that need quite sophisticated care if they're going to survive. So that a parent mammal has to be able to discern if the infant is hungry or tired or cold or thirsty or what it needs and provide for those specific needs or the, or the infant will die. So mammals have all parts of their brains that are oriented specifically towards sensing signals that come from another mammal, interpreting them, and feeling disposed to care for the needs that are sensed there. So this is more than simple emotion. This is more than happiness or sadness. This is a part of us that is hardwired to understand what, how the other person is feeling. and We get a direct sensory experience, actually, of the insides of another person's brain, which is quite remarkable if you think about it. But if you and I knew each other well, I could sense what's going on in your brain. Now, you explained how this worked using, at least for me, a really interesting pretty wide-held conventional wisdoms. I mean, among them, and for me, one of the, the most shocking was the fact that uh, you were found through your research that mothers who suffered depression were four times like, more likely to have children who uh, experienced uh, sudden infant death syndrome, mm -hmm. SIDS, and that, in fact, the incidence of SIDS is higher than in America than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. What is the linkage you're trying to, uh, to develop here? Well, SIDS has been a mystery for a long time, and of course, usually parents put the child to bed and then the child dies right. with no apparent cause. And one of the um, really uh, cutting-edge lines of thought that's evolving about sudden infant death is that in light of what we're talking about, about, say, people establishing these vital regulatory ties, it's especially vital between parents and infants mm -hmm. who are fragile actually, and probably have the most vulnerable bodies and, and minds and brains imaginable. And that what sudden infant death may represent is a failure of that regulatory process, that the infant is not getting enough regulation from a parent, and its own cardiorespiratory brain rhythms can't be sustained on its own, and they collapse and the infant dies. And there's some fascinating research done by uh, James McKenna, a sleep scientist at Notre Dame, who studied infants and children, uh, infants and mothers sleeping together, and he was the first person actually to study this. And he found that their sleep rhythms are intertwined during the night, that they're each regulating each other's sleep level. And 
the hypothesis is that if you take infants out of that communal context of sleep, you may be depriving them of a vital physiologic influence they need to stay alive during the night. Well, and that in fact the higher incidence of SIDS may reflect the cultural bias against parents mm -hmm. sleeping with children. It may, because one of the puzzles of SIDS is that its incidence varies so widely in the world. The United States has the highest rate right. in the world, two per thousand live births. Some countries have rates that are ten or a hundred times lower. And so the question is, what is that cultural factor in this country that is putting our children at risk? And one of the ideas that we're raising in the book is it could well be that our culture discourages close contact between infant and parent, particularly at night. Mm -hmm. Now, this also has fairly widespread uh, implications. If how a child is loved during mm -hmm. childhood, and especially the proximity between the child and, uh, and the parent, the mother in, in this particular instance, uh, directly affects both their health and how they love in the future, are we to conclude, therefore, stay-at-home parenting is better for a child, better for society, than two parents working? There's no question, actually, that stay-at-home parenting is better for children. Now, the real question is, how much better? Is it so much better that parents should do that? Or is it so much better that we should make a big uh, effort to revamp our society? Mm -hmm. And the evidence is mounting that because the parent and child have this regulatory relationship, um, along this brain pathway, the parent is actually regulating the development of a child's growing brain mm -hmm. because the child's brain is growing by tremendous leaps and bounds, especially in the first couple years of life, and that during this vital period of brain growth, normal development of the brain depends on that special biological connection with the parent's brain. If we interfere with that and don't allow children enough exposure, we could be depriving them of something which is, helps make their brain turn out the healthiest. Can daycare be a surrogate for parental love in that respect, you think? Probably not, actually. Most daycare, as it's conducted, um, is of the impersonal variety. Mm -hmm. The children are cared for by a rotating series of impersonal caretakers that there's a lot of staff turnover, there's very little personal interaction between the infants and, and the, or the children and the staff. And these are really conditions that are hostile to the biological needs for connectedness that children have. So institutional kinds of daycare, because of the element of impersonality that they necessarily inject uh, into a child's life, are hostile to those needs. Now, and again, the real question is, how hostile are they? How many hours of impersonal daycare can a child sustain before the mind is at risk? Right. Now, some of this directly challenges early childhood development theory. I mean, part supports to the extent that there's, there's no question that relations between parents and child, you know, have a major part in forming the brain in that crucial zero to three, zero to five. But this also suggests, unlike early childhood development theory that says everything's finished, you're fully formed, mm -hmm. that this isn't the case at all, that our evolution as human beings, the, the state of our brain is ever-changing and evolving and conditioned based on who we love. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, uh, you know, the more we learn about the brain, the more we learn about how changeable it actually is. So there's more and more reason to think that it's changeable. Just in the past year, we used to think that the brain, that the number of cells in the brain was fixed and you couldn't get any new ones. Mm -hmm. Now we know that the brain adds thousands of new cells every day. So it's clear that the brain does change on an ongoing basis and that our relationships are a vital part of what makes it change and makes it change in certain directions. And that occurs across the lifespan right up until the day right. we die. Now, if we're hardwired... <laughs> the fun thing I like to do with the wind is, you know, you see the branches kind of flowing and stuff, right? I like to think of the branches as moving, blowing the wind, as opposed to the wind blowing the branches. So it's kind of fun, these things, and they start to look like that, too. Like, you'll feel them move first, and then the wind will come, and you're like, oh, I fuck. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Because why wouldn't a, a tree just wiggle? You know what I mean? Like, yes. like what makes it wiggle? You know what I mean? Like, maybe the trees move first. <laughs> 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 so it's just having fun like that with life and be, being a child, right? It's, uh, I believe it says, um, lest you be converted unto a child, you won't uh, enter the kingdom of heaven, right? So uh, then he goes on to say the kingdom of heaven isn't here or there, it's inside you. So if you want to know your insides, know what you're made of, See the world as a child, as a child. Yeah, see the world with great awe. 
great reverence. A child doesn't just run around everywhere doing anything. It knows, hey, there might be a, a slip somewhere. I might slip somewhere. I gotta kind of watch it, you know, and you know, or there might be an animal that I have to be mindful about or something, you know. So you don't just run around all crazy, but you do run around in fun. You know, you're always in love and having fun, and then all and um, unconditionally gracing people. You know, like a kid graces you no matter what. With, and they don't have to talk to you. you. Don't you have to know what you did for a living or work or none of that mm. shit? You know, it's like being a child is being easy. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I imagine having children. You have such a greater appreciation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And allow me to really wield it. You know, because I, mean? I was trying to cultivate it beforehand, but now I'm really cultivating it, so it's really nice. And to be able to grace them and allow them to always keep themselves. It's like, you remember yourself right now, and I'm going to reflect yourself to you. I'm not trying to make you anything different right now, because you need to remember this forever. Mm. This is you. This is who you are. You always have this. People want to take their kid away from themselves and say, you need to learn to potty, and you need to learn to do this. You need to, you need to learn all this stuff, and you need to become more. Well, yeah, they need to become more. They will. But for now, let them really soak in and imprint this child on themselves. You know, because if you grow up too fast, you don't have that imprint so strong, and it's harder to build it back up. You know, if the imprint's very strong, it's very easy, you know, to slip right back into it, you know. So if you give uh, your child a strong childhood, they always have a very close inner child. And that is an eternal being. That's their internal, that's their external, eternal being. And it's on the inside. <laughs> you know, it's, it's their interface with the physical reality. Is your childlike essence. That's your true interface, you know, forever. Uh, it's what's there before you're born, and it's what's there after you, after everything else. It's always your childlike nature. And so if you really give that to a child in a physical reality, you really give them something good. You know, the only gift that you can give a child, because you don't give them their smart, so you get that from God. <laughs> you know, you don't give them their whatever, you know, all that stuff they either chose to pick up or not, because we know kids that rebel. You know, would you give them their rebellion? <laughs> All you can really give them that was a strong inner child. And you can only do that within the first couple of years because that's when they are their child. You know, so it's very important to be with your kids. It's the very first years. That's, that's what I've done. I'm home. Home right now. I don't give a shit about this or that with them kids. I'm doing my best to play with them as much as possible, be with them as much as possible, and give them that space to live, move, and grow without thinking about them as a kid. Put your kids in a daycare. I don't care how good they are; they still believe that they're kids. My kids don't need that belief. They need the belief that they're an eternal being, <laughs> you know, that knows what's right for them or their own self. And if I can grace them with that belief and that space to grow in, they grow into that. And you see that. I mean, you see them. You know what I mean? Like they're very lovely, very mindful. They know who they are. They know what's going on. Like they're they're, they're not aloof. You know, they're very fine. <laughs> very strong kids. Uh, that's what I was allowed. I was allowed to keep my, my child growing up. And uh, I realized the gift that I was given, and I made sure to cultivate the ability to do that as an adult so I could do that with my children. And then as I did that with my children, I received it with myself. <laughs> and that was the blessing of the children. It's, uh, they allowed me to remember to work, to cultivate the ability to give that gift. And then once I gave it, you know, I received it again. I thought I had it. But I realized that I could get it even more. <laughs> you know, it's very nice. That's cool. Yeah, I hope for it someday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And really, you can just soak that in now. And when you see it around, you know that these are your children. All mm -hmm. children are your children. You know, and you just kind of sit with that space a little bit. And be like, ah, how cool. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can reap the benefits without having to go through the physicality, you know? That's a good thing, you know? Uh, but when you do have it, it will be unique and special, and you'll be gracing us all with the, the unique way you do it. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I look forward to it, no doubt, you know? Also, uh, you live with my kids, too, in the meantime. That way you don't yearn for nothing, you know what I mean? Not that you're, you're earning particularly, you know what I mean? I'm just talking about in general here, you know? Uh, when you see something that you really love, you enjoy it as if it's your own then, and then you'll get it in the ways that you really need it, as opposed to, you know, sometimes we can look at things and reach a little too much, you know, put ourselves in interesting situations. And if you already have it already,